Clips, where the actors have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting through actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi, everybody. I'm Ron Brewington, and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Our guest today is a renowned veteran actress who has opened the doors in Hollywood for many black actresses. She's beautiful. She's talented. She's versatile. She was the first African-American villainess on television in 1964. Back in the 60s, when actors in the entertainment industry had to be signed with a major motion picture studio just to be considered for work, this lady was the first black woman to receive a contract to a major motion picture studio. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll please welcome a longtime friend. I love her dearly. Please join me in welcoming Miss Judy Pace. Judy, thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you, darling, for well, having oh, me. Wouldn't have Absolutely. Any other way. Sure. I hear those dates and I feel like my chrome walker's outside or something. <laughs> but luckily it's not. But it's still here and it's still looking good. <laughs> thank you, darling. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, Hello. Thank you so much. You were born and raised right here in Los Angeles, California, weren't you? Yes, darling, I'm a native. Uh. My dad came out here. He escaped from Jackson, Mississippi in the 30s. Uh -huh. And he said as far as he could run was to the Pacific Ocean, and so that's when he stopped. He just wanted to get as far away from Mississippi as he possibly could. <laughs> and we always said, thank you, Daddy, you came to Southern California. <laughs> Now, yes. you were raised in your mother's uh, uh, store she had? Yes, my mom was so talented, mm -hmm. and my grandmother was very talented. Mm -hmm. They were beautiful, and everyone says their mother's beautiful, but oh, yeah. my mommy was beautiful. Look at Did you hear me? Look hello, at hello. <laughs> she was gorgeous. So she had Kitty's Boutique. Yes. And it was the largest black-owned ladies' apparel shop west of the Mississippi, according to Dunn and Bradstreet. Um, they had the shop for over 35 years, and clients mm -hmm. were Nichelle Nichols of Star Trek, who mm -hmm. I met when I was 14 in my mom's shop, and we've been friends ever since. Um, Mrs. Nat King Cole, Sarah Vaughn. I mean, they, she had just wonderful people. And she did something really special. She was way ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. On Thursday nights, mm -hmm. my mom would close the shop at mm -hmm. about 5 o'clock. Okay. And then around 7 o'clock, she'd open it up again. And at that point, persons who impersonated females would come into the shop, flying in from New York, uh -huh. flying in from Chicago. So she would give the opportunity to the men who impersonated women or men who really just wanted to dress up as women mm -hmm. um, way before uh, Bruce Jenner, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they would come, and they would be in there until 12 o'clock at night. She designed for them, she created beautiful gowns for them, mm -hmm. and made them feel free and wonderful, because my mom always said, we come here the way we come here, and mm -hmm. that's it. And that's mm -hmm. just the way it is. So wow. she was wonderful. She was, and her name, please, again? Her name was Kitty, and the shop was called Kitty's Boutique. Okay, okay. Yes, for a good so, 35 years. So you really had a lot of influence. All these people, all these celebrities coming in oh, here it made you want to get into the business, uh, didn't uh, mm, Somewhat, somewhat. But, you know, there was that uh, color code mm. situation that they had in films. Um, if you weren't honey-colored... And I was not honey colored. You I mean was the brown dark. Bag test? Uh, yeah, darling. I wasn't passing that test to be on screen All at right. that time. Mm -hmm. Because if you wanted to be an actress, you had absolutely magnificently beautiful women like Lena Horne and Dorothy Dandridge. And they weren't and my Judy shade. Page. Well, no, I came later. <laughs> I had the distinction of being the first dark diva. Okay? All right. All right. All right. <laughs> so, no, I had, it was something I wanted to do, but it was something I felt the opportunity would not be there for me to do it. Mm -hmm. But with the encouragement of my mom and my dad, yeah. who said, we're in Southern California, you can do anything you want to do. <laughs> Pop was head of oh, he mind. was really head of the curve. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, it happened. I started as a model first. Started as a model, Because okay. I was modeling in my mom's shop, doing mm -hmm. the fashion shows for my mother, mm -hmm. um, and did quite, quite well. Surprised my own self. I became the first continuing face of Pepsi. Okay. This is in the 60s. I was Fashion Fair's first um, spokesmodel and um, did their first commercials. A Polaroid mm -hmm. camera. If you bought a Polaroid camera, you saw me. I was the color girl. Now, this, this, well, <laughs> in the package. Every okay. package had me in it. Wow. <laughs> had me wow. in it. Okay. Um, 
just just lots of um, uh, Johnson's hair products. Um, mm -hmm. Did a lot of of, of a, I thought national billboards and things like yeah. that as yeah. a model. So I I enjoyed it very much. And then um, I think I had the opportunity that so many ladies would have loved to have had who were models. I had the opportunity to travel with the most incredible fashion show ever put on in the United States. That and being? it was called the Ebony Fashion Fair. All right. All right. <laughs> and it ran for mm -hmm. 50 years. Wow. 50 years. It just stopped recently. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I had an opportunity to do that. Wow. Her, so her I loved it. Mrs. Johnson and will always be remembered. Oh, my, my God. Yes. My God. That's how I got my first, that's how I got my contract. Mm. Uh, with Columbia Studios. Mm -hmm. um, they saw me in Ebony Magazine. Right. <laughs> and had to go audition with everybody else, but I, I got the job, got mm -hmm. the contract, mm -hmm. and then went on to be under contract to, um, to 20th Century Fox, right. and the first to get a three-movie deal starring with American International Films. Um, and we're talking 60s here, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not talking, um, what's the term? I'm not talking about what I call the black film renaissance. Okay. Some people refer to it as black exploitation, exploitation films. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I call it the black film renaissance. Okay. Yeah. And um, one of the things I love is that I did a film called Cotton Comes to Harlem. Okay. Starring Raymond St. Jacques and Godfrey Cambridge and Red Fox and myself and uh, Calvin Lockhart. And it was the first blockbuster film with an all-black cast okay. uh, that came in and the top 10 films for the year and the studios are like what huh how'd that happen so we ushered in cotton comes to harlem ushered in the black film renaissance well let's take a look at cotton comes to harlem <laughs> oh, a little bit oh, you, little, oh, you, little, okay. oh yes got a little bit something coming for you all righty <laughs> Can we come in? <sighs> Mad child as she is. My dear. Now, do you think you could finish telling me about your mother? Well, um, mostly she likes to rub my neck. Like this? She's a stone fox. Watch your ass. Well, sweat digger. You are really one ugly child. I mean, it's really too bad. Because, uh, if you wasn't, we could, uh, spend the time, you know, uh, doing the thing. I'll put a sack over my head. All right. Oh, I just wanted to see if it was going to fit. Fuck off. <laughs> You're not a fag, are you? <laughs> oh, wow, a fag cop. <laughs> Love beads for the fag cop. Please. Hey, you come. Hey, come back here, you. Okay. Stop. All right. <laughs> wow. Oh my God, I hadn't seen that in so long. I had so much fun making that film. That was a ball. We yes. shot in Harlem. Right. It was the first film shot completely My in home. Harlem. I love Harlem. Born and raised in Harlem. Oh, oh, I love Harlem. Yes. And it was so wonderful there. Just the, the see, being from Southern California. Uh huh. Um, and I was raised in the Cal Southern California, Los Angeles, in the '40s. Okay. So the tallest building in LA was the City Hall. Okay. And it was only 12 stories. So leaving here and going to New York was like, wow. Because wow. <laughs> L.A. was just a small country town. And it really still is. We just keep pushing the freeways and moving the traffic. That's all we do. Now, <laughs> obviously, the question of your color did come up at some times, I'm sure. 
But you know what? It always came up in the positive. Okay. Because I was almost like a novelty. Oh. <laughs> Somewhat of a novelty. Okay. So it would come up in the in the best way. Uh -huh. um, it, it was like, oh, okay, we know she's an African-American. We weren't African-Americans then. We were still Negroes and, and colored. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, we, were, yes. we were still colored. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it worked for me. It worked for me mm -hmm. at that time. It really did. It did. Um, it gave me a lot of opportunities. Um, Peyton Place. Right. The first black family of drama on mm -hmm. television with Ruby D, Glenn Turman, and myself. Right. And, and the first black villainous on TV. Was. I was an evil, evil, <laughs> evil child on TV. <laughs> One thing about having brown skin, dark brown skin, I always had the opportunity to play usually the bad girl. <laughs> You know, like the one you just saw in Cotton Comes to Harlem. Yes. So I'm doing this villainous on Peyton Place. And mm -hmm. I used to have ladies see me on the street and be annoyed with me. And go, well, why are you doing that to that boy? I was blackmailing Glenn Turman, who was the doctor's son. And I had hitchhiked my way from Harlem to Peyton Place. And I was pregnant. And I moved in with Ruby D, his mother, and just took over. So I was really evil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was really evil. But it was fun. It was fun. Um... Doing the film with um, with uh, Yvette Menu with mm -hmm. with um, um, Three in the Attic mm -hmm. was really wonderful for American International Films. They were so good to me. And then I did another film for them called um, The Frogs, and it became like it's still a cult film now. It's like part of one of those first films where um, the environment was being endangered, that kind of thing. And one thing about working for American International Films. My roles were never black or white. <laughs> they never said, in the script, they never said colored girl. It just said usually young lady or pretty girl. Or, mm -hmm. So they just, they would offer me the roles or you were going to do that role. Mm -hmm. um, I did um, Down in the Cellar playing uh, Larry Hagman. Yeah. You're Larry Hagman? Mm -hmm. uh, starring with Larry Hagman and Joan Collins okay. uh, in a movie called Down in the Cellar, Up in the Cellar. Um, and I was his girlfriend, and uh, we had nice little love scenes and all those sorts of things. Yes. And they always paired me with, I never had a black boyfriend in any of my American international films. Yeah. <laughs> they just were like pushing the envelope, pushing yeah, the envelope. Pushing the envelope. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But it was all fun. It really yeah. was. Okay. Yes, yes. Now, you did another movie on television called Brian's Song. Oh, I love that movie. Yes. With that handsome child, Billy D. Williams. Billy D. Williams, yes. Oh, yeah. Love Billy D. Love Billy D. Okay. Um, Billy and I were doing Brian's Song, mm -hmm. and um, we didn't know what a big movie it was going to be. Uh -huh. it, it took the ratings on television for the movies of the week. Mm -hmm. um, and to this day, I, I don't know if they did it last year, it would open the football season right. on television and they would do Brian's song. It won and was nominated for best film, best writer, best director. Um, it, it was just a great film and it set off Billy's uh, D. Williams career. And a funny thing was, while we were doing mm -hmm. Brian's song, as we were wrapping, almost wrapping up, he was going to go audition for uh, Lady Sings the Blues. All right. And all during the film, he had been trying to get an audition, mm -hmm. and he couldn't get the audition. Mm -hmm. He finally got in there, and you, the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> the rest is history. Well, let's take He's a look like, at Brian's song and see what oh, it looks okay. like. A little short right. version. Right. Okay. <laughs> Gil, it's just so good to have you home. Yeah, it's good to be home. Can I get you anything? Nope. I'm fine. Well, it's almost lunchtime. Would you like a um, sandwich or something? No, I'm not hungry. You go ahead, though. Well, I left the kids at Joy, so I guess I better go pick them up. Will you be all right? Yeah. You sure? Yes. Sure. I said that was beauty. You said that was she was cute. <laughs> she was cute. Uh. Yeah, she was cute. When I when I see myself on in films now, looking yes. back, see you know we're talking fifty years ago. Okay, okay. Do you know that mm -hmm. one with um, with Bill Cosby? Uh huh. That's got to be that has to be sixty three. Wow. So we're talking 
over half a century ago. Mm. So I feel like I've been on an incredible journey. Wow. A fun journey, yes mm. indeed. You know, Hollywood hasn't changed much. They really go for beauty. You have to have beauty. An, on an average looking girl sometimes might not have a chance, would you? You know what? Sometimes it, it kind of weeds itself out. Mm -hmm. You might be selected as you're standing in the row and you are the hot beauty. Right. But you can then also be told to go sit down if you don't bring forward some talent. Wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You right. got to, You still have to bring forward that talent. Right. Um, and, and, and being an African-American colored Negro black girl, mm -hmm. we had to have additional. You had to sing, right. dance, yeah. act do comedy, the whole gamut. We, we had to do that. You had to come there with a full plate. You couldn't just come in saying, oh, I just act. Oh, I just do drama. No, you had to do the whole range. For a number of years, Gary Marshall, you mm -hmm. know Gary Marshall, yes. the, the master of comedy, yes. all the sitcoms, sitcoms he had, he, did, yes. he was my manager. Yeah. I love comedy. Mm. I was uh, in Harvey Limbeck's comedy workshop and that's how I met met, um, met Gary right. through there. Uh, just I love comedy and I was able to do all the comedy shows and I had the opportunity to do something that was not filmed. It was a stage production mm -hmm. of I think the most incredible written comedy role ever done and it was called Guys and Dolls. Right. You know the Broadway production of yeah, Guys and yeah, Dolls? They did an all black mm -hmm. production mm -hmm. in Vegas in uh, the Latin Center and with Leslie Uggams playing Sister Sarah Okay. and I'm playing Adelaide which is the best written comedic role ever. I got to sing, I got to dance, <laughs> I got to be funny. I love funny. I love funny. I think comedy is the hardest thing to do. I really do. Mm. Drama, we always know it's going to make you cry. Oh, yeah, it's going to make you cry. But yeah. you don't know what's That's going to make happen. you laugh. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you just don't know. Really, Being truly. the first black, dark complexion beauty on screen, uh, how much pressure was on you personally that you took personally? I didn't take any of it personally. I was mm. having a good time. Okay. I just didn't take it personally. I, I took it all as just a magnificent blessing. Uh huh. A blessing and want something to appreciate. Be happy. I'm doing it. I mean, I was I was truly blessed. Mm -hmm. um, there weren't many of us out there doing it. And right. I mean, who's under contract in 1962? Who's doing television in 1963, 64? I mean, who was? Wow. I mean, th this was during the time. And if young people, you tell young people this that when someone was on TV and they were black you would get on the phone and call your friends and say, turn on channel two, there's a black man on there. Turn on channel four, there's a black woman on there. Oh my God, there's a black child. Yes. Um, Glenn Terman and I have the distinction of being the first continuing characters who were black and teenagers on television. We were playing, I'm playing a 16 year old, he's playing a 17 year old um, in Peyton Place. Hmm. We just weren't, we weren't there. We weren't there at all. Wow. Um, I mean, except for Bill Cosby. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was able to do I Spy, and I think I Spy came on in, what, 63, I think I was saying to mm -hmm. you. Um, I have, um, Bill Cosby was the first black to have a television series titled Bear, the name of the character he plays. Okay. I'm the first black woman to have a series and the title bears the name of the character I play. And the series was The Young Lawyers. And I was the young lawyer. Right. <laughs> yes, I was with Lee J. Cobb. It was first a movie. Yes. And they liked the movie, and then they made it into a series. Got you. So I played the first black lawyer on TV and drama. When people met you during that time frame, yeah. what did they say to you? Um, either they thought they knew me, or did I go to high school with you? <laughs> <laughs> You look like my sister. Uh -huh. And then finally it might come to them or it would be immediately, I hated you on Peyton Place. I didn't like you on so-and-so, but I thought you were fabulous and blip blah 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 So it was either one or, or the, the other, other yes. but then it always turned out to being um, very loving and can I have your autograph? And I never had anyone really 
get really angry with me, they might be angry with the character, but mm -hmm. but not with me. It's so interesting it was fun. because it's interesting because in that time frame, civil rights was happening in this country. Oh yeah, Martin Luther King was Dr. Martin oh. Luther King was marching. Oh my God! And all all the the horrific images we were seeing coming out of different states yes. from the north to the south. I mean, it was just people dying, churches being bombed. It was a very horrific time in our history. There had been other times that were worse than that, and we were still trying mm -hmm. to come out of that kind of force. Um, so it was a very important, important time. I feel that I graduated from high school mm -hmm. in you know, this was this is something you didn't say years ago, yes. 10, 20 years ago. You didn't say when you graduated. If you're a woman, you never said how old you were when you graduated from high school. But look, if you look me up, guess what they tell you? First they tell you my name, then they tell you what year Ooh, I was born. Right. So there is just no way to get around that at all, none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So um, it was just, it was an interesting time. It really, yes, really was. It was. When you were in the studio a lot, I'm told there was a guy that you ran into named Joseph. Can you tell me about it? Oh, my God. This is what, oh, you know that story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is this my camera right here? This is your camera. Okay. <laughs> this, this is the story. Okay, I'm signed to Columbia Studios. Right. We're talking 1962. Okay. Anybody who can add, you can see that was over, over half a century ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the lot, and there's only one other brown person on the whole lot, and his name is Joseph. Mm. I found out his real name after sitting and having a conversation mm -hmm. with him. Everybody else just called him Joe. Mm -hmm. Joe was the shoeshine boy, and they called him boy, and they called him Joe. And that was the only other brown person on that entire Columbia lot, meaning their mm -hmm. lot in right off of Gower and Sunset mm -hmm. and their other facility. They were screen gym out in the valley. There were no brown people, none. So I am so amazed that I have lived long enough and am still sane and can <laughs> truly appreciate all of these beautiful mm. brown, ch I call them children, all of these beautiful brown children we have on television today. Mm. Um, I think it's historical that you have this one magnificent brown woman who's producing one, two, three, four hours of prime time drama, mm -hmm. and you know her name, call her name, call her name. Uh, Judy Pace. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about that. No, 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 no. We're talking about, I don't know, I'm going to mispronounce her name, Sandra. Chandra Ryans. Oh, you mean talking about now? Yeah, right oh, yeah. now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right now oh, yeah. I'm talking about she's producing oh, yeah. four hours of prime time mm -hmm. drama. There was a time they told us we couldn't even do drama, right. let alone provide it, produce it, and get it out there. Yes. I, I I never thought I would ever see that. I just feel I'm living through a very blessed time. You've met Sandra? Once. 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 I'd love to do her show. I'll oh. tell you the show I really love to do is that. I just love it. I just love it. Empire. Oh, Empire. I love Empire. Uh. I was like, I want to do that show. I'm coming out of retirement to come to do just that show. <laughs> I love that show. I just, and I love everybody on it. I love all the characters, all the drama. I think it's magnificent, really and truly. Talking about actors and actresses, my daughter, Julia. Mm -hmm. My daughter, Julia, Julia Pace Mitchell, yes. who's an absolute beauty. Yes. She was on The Young and the Restless for over three years. She's now married and has a beautiful little two-year-old child, and she's taking a sabbatical, but she worked a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Both my daughters are... Um, are. Oh, yes, look at that beautiful Didn't picture. she gorgeous? Yeah, she? Yes. Oh. She played Sophia Dupree on The Young and the Restless. Mm. Very wealthy woman and ran the company. Mm. She was fabulous. You also yeah. saw her in Notorious and Law and Orders and Law and Order SUV, uh, Cold Case. She was a working actress. Both of my daughters are Howard graduates. Mm -hmm. um, Julie is also has a master's degree in performing arts. Yes. And she also had a full scholarship to Oxford University <laughs> in England with their um, very special Shakespeare um, uh, studies program. And then my other daughter, Sean, she's a beauty, and Sean is my daughter, and she is my attorney. attorney yes. She, too, is a Howard <laughs> graduate. Both of my daughters wanted to go to the traditional, uh, historical black colleges, yes. and I was happy they did because I loved Howard University. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. really did. Really lovely. Uh, my daughter, Julia, fully didn't have much of a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, her dad was also an actor. 
Yes. Her sister, Jean Pace, is also an actress-singer. Her uncle, Oscar Brown Jr., is also a songwriter, singer, icon within yes. the world of jazz. Mm -hmm. So she just just loved being in that business, and I'm just so happy. I'll tell you one thing. It would be awful. Ladies and gentlemen, it would be awful if you have a child mm -hmm. who wants to go into the entertainment industry, right. and they don't have an ounce of talent. Yes. <laughs> Now, I mean, that would just be terrible. I was blessed. My daughter is very talented. Mm -hmm. She's also a, a screen, she writes, not screen, plays. Mm -hmm. And while she was on The Young and the Restless, she was nominated three times for NAACP Image Awards for Best Actress in Daytime Drama. Wow. I won an NAACP Image, Image Award, Award? Yes. for The Young Lawyer yes, as Best in Drama. How many how many episodes you doing that show? 25? <sighs> Oh, Lordy, I a don't, lot. a lot, a yes. lot. And then I was nominated for um, numerous, like for Brian's song and, mm -hmm. and Cotton Comes to Harlem. And yes. I got about maybe five or six nominations for the NAACP right. Image Awards, which I think is a still a fabulous tradition within the yes. entertainment industry, yes. really and truly. You mentioned Don Mitchell. You oh. guys, how'd you guys first meet? <gasps> Do you really want to know? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I for, my husband, Don Mitchell, my first husband, uh, Don Mitchell, uh, I met him on a shoot. I was doing, remember I told you I was like the continuing face of Pepsi Cola? Mm -hmm. I was doing one of the Pepsi shoots, mm -hmm. and Don, being new here to L.A., mm -hmm. was one of the extras in the background on a beach with the swimsuit on, and I'm in a swimsuit, and it was a bunch of us young people having a party on the mm -hmm. beach, and that's when I first met Don Mitchell when he first came out here. Wow. We just became kind of... Not friends, 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 but mm -hmm. we knew each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a couple of years later that we um, we dated mm -hmm. in the 60s uh, for about maybe five or six months, and that mm -hmm. was it. Then I married him in the 70s. <laughs> and you even appeared on his show, Ironside. I was on Ironside. That was mm -hmm. after we were married, mm -hmm. right. So my daughter, Julia, had actor blood in her on both sides. Outstanding. Yes. yes. And then um, me and Don divorced, mm -hmm. and I met this incredible gentleman named Kurt Flood, uh -huh. he's a major league baseball player, Yes, and we met in a very strange way. I had done about three, you remember, wait, let me start over. Do you remember the show, The Dating Game? Yes. Okay, The Dating they, Game. There weren't too many blacks on there. Uh, no, darling, there weren't in too fact, many I blacks. I believe you were the first. I don't know if I was one of the first, but yes. I was one of the few. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I had done about three dating games, mm -hmm. daytime dating games, right. and now they're going to have their nighttime show. Mm -hmm. So for their nighttime premiere show, and it premiered on Thanksgiving night, okay. they, of course, called my agent and asked me if I would come and do the show. And I was like, yeah, nighttime premiere, Thanksgiving night, I'm coming to do the show. Uh -huh. So on the show, there were three bachelors, male, black, black men, I'm trying to say, black men who were bachelors, mm -hmm. and I was the one asking the questions. And one of the gentlemen, who was a bachelor, was a very, 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 very famous icon in the world of sports called Willie Mays. Willie Mays. And it. once you shoot the show, mm -hmm. they can then say who's going to be on the show. So they had advertised that Willie Mays was going to be on the show. Well, Willie Mays and my husband played the outfield. So every athlete was watching to see what the heck is Willie Mays doing on the dating game show. So Kurt saw me on the dating game show. Mm -hmm. He liked what he saw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he and this is what he did. That next day, he calls the station and asks how can he reach the girl who was on the dating game show. And they said, we can't tell you how. You call her age, call her agent, call Screen Actors Guild. So he calls Screen Actors Guild. Right. And he got the name of my agent at William Morris, Cy Marsh, and he was a baseball fan, mm -hmm. so he felt he was quite comfortable in giving Kurt Flood the telephone number to my mother's boutique because it was a public number. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so he started calling, mm -hmm. and I didn't know who he was. And he, he called one day, and my mom said, oh, Judy's at home. Why don't you call her at home? So he got my dad. And him and my dad had this great friendship going, so when he'd call to talk to me, I'd let him talk to my dad. This went on for about a year. He sent me baseball cards. He sent me newspaper articles he a couple didn't of times. A couple of times he <laughs> called and said, I let Judy know I'm going to be on the news tonight, on mm -hmm. the sports news, and watch me. She can mm -hmm. see me. And I did, and he looked okay. And finally, my dad said to me, he said, you are just being rude. 
you need to go out with that young man. They don't have any junk playing Major League Baseball. He's like a Jackie Robinson. Right. You need to go out with I said, okay, Daddy, I'll go out with him. <laughs> it's a year later because mm -hmm. now it's the World Series. I was right. on TV the year before mm -hmm. for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So he calls, I talk to him, and I said, okay, we can go out. Mm -hmm. But we have to go somewhere where there's a lot of people. And we have to have a chaperone. He said, okay, and okay. He mm -hmm. says, I'll call you back. About 15 minutes later, he calls back, and this is what the man said. He said, would Dodger Stadium do the World Series for a lot of people? And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> he said, I have tickets for your mother, your father, my father, and my aunt. Will they do for chaperones? I was like, yeah. Okay, here's the info. And that's when I, my first date with Kurt was at Dodger Stadium for the World Series. And we just hit it off. Uh, mm. <laughs> we hit it off like that. Mm. That was in the 60s, of course. Right, in the 60s. And right, and we didn't marry until the 80s. 20 years later. 20 years later. Wow. But Talk we were together for a good four right. or five years, yes, and the, that was my steady. We call that well, carrying a flame. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, he did something else I thought was really, really, which really took my heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, after we went for the date on at Dodger Stadium, right. about a week later he called, but he had been calling. He mm -hmm. called and said, let's go out to dinner. And I'm like, well, you're in St. Louis. He says, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm here in town. I'm here in town. I said, okay. So we go out to dinner. And he tells me, I've taken an apartment at the Sunset Plaza, and I'm going to be staying here for the winter so I can get to know you. So he moved to L.A. for his winter break, and that's how we got to know each other. Wow. And that's how I first met Kurt Flood. Mm. Can, mm. I, can I say about my... The, Please, oh, go yeah. right ahead. Um, Something wonderful has just happened for my husband. Um, he is the father of free agency. Mm -hmm. He took a case all the way to the Supreme Court. Yes. He played Major League Baseball for over 16 years, two World Series rings, seven consecutive gold gloves. A gold glove means that you were the best person in that position, and he yes. was a center fielder. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was a, ma a magnificent uh, player. He was signed in 1957. He's part of that first generation after Jackie Robinson. Yeah. Well, he took a case all the way to the Supreme Court because when you play Major League Sports in any disciplines of sports, you would be signed to a team for your entire life. You right. could not go out and say, I want to see if they want me over here or mm -hmm. can I go over here and work. You had to go where they traded you or where they told you to go, which sounds kind of barbaric when you but think about it. That's the way to do it. So he took yeah. a case all the way to the Supreme Court in order to get that changed. That action started a change within the world of sports. Um, there is a congressional act that bears the name of Kurt Flood. It's called the Kurt Flood Act, Bill Number 21. That was his number. Right. It's the only congressional act that bears the name of an athlete and their number. Mm -hmm. And the reason why sports could do that is because Congress had given them special privileges with the Kurt Flood Act. It took away those special privileges. Wow. And Major League Baseball Players Association, that's their union, mm -hmm. they're celebrating their 50th anniversary. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they're celebrating my husband, Kurt, uh, with a U.S. postal stamp. <laughs> <laughs> a U.S. postal stamp. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, we unveiled it just this month in April. So they'll be celebrating until the uh, World Series. So it's the first time anything like this has ever happened happen right. really and truly so now, I'm as really happy. Widow, you're continuing action like try to see if you can get him in a uh, rock well and just that last event. summer they did mm -hmm. a special day of recognition right. for Kurt at um, in Cooperstown okay. um, and he was also placed just last summer into the Baseball Hall of Fame for the team he played for for almost 16 years with the St. Louis Cardinals yes. so there's always wonderful things that are happening for Kurt because he really set a bar. He he really did, and right. and it's wonderful that all the players are celebrating are celebrating him because they owe him a lot, don't they? They owe this man a lot. <laughs> oh, they do. He changed mm -hmm. the way they do business in the right. world of uh, sports and all disciplines. Um, Time magazine when they did the Millennium mm -hmm. issue, and they named the ten most influential athletes for the whole century. Mm -hmm. And my husband, Kurt Flood, was one of those yes. ten. Mm -hmm. And this is the statement they used. They said, 
I'm kind of paraphrasing, uh, that all athletes should thank God for Kurt Flood. He changed the way they do business in all disciplines of sports, mm -hmm. and they should all applaud him. So I thought that was just, and then they went on and said more stuff, but that was the main thing. Yeah. And of course, the management wasn't too happy about some of the things he was trying to bring up. Oh, I think these guys make 90 zillion million dollars a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm not talking about their endorsements either, not the shoes <laughs> and the this and the that. I, and I think it's wonderful. But Mike, Kurt always said they still aren't making enough money. No. You have to wonder, how much money is the man making who's signing the check? Right. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. But I, I, um, I was, I'm just so proud of him. And he was just the most incredible individual. Oh, and the stamp, the image on the stamp is his self-portrait. Okay. He was, okay. he was truly talented. <laughs> He's okay. truly talented. All right. Yes, now, yes. HBO had a movie that called The Curious Case of yes. Kurt Flood. Yes. Um, HBO did it. I think it was an hour and a half documentary mm -hmm. on my husband that HBO did. Mm -hmm. uh, ESPN has also done a documentary. And one of my very favorite documentaries was done by Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. He did a documentary on, on, on Kurt. Mm -hmm. um, and it won a couple of awards. It was for yes. the Brian Gumbel show. Right. And um, it was really wonderful. So there's been a lot of different um, things that have been happening. Right now we're working on the Kurt Flood story, the movie. Yes. <laughs> what about the Judy Pace biograph? Uh, that will come later. Okay. Right. <laughs> but it could come. It, it could, could be come. exciting. Yeah. You know, we're talking, you know, two a lot of here yeah, yes. two, two, mm -hmm. two stories going on mm -hmm. here. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh, and my brother-in-law, Oscar Brown Jr., uh, he's married to my sister, Jean Pace, was a magnificent vocalist. Mm -hmm. um, they just honored him by naming a street in Chicago after All him. Right. It's called Oscar Brown Jr. Way. Okay. And it's so apropos for him because he did things his way. His way. Mm -hmm. He really did. Yes, yes, yes. Now, back in the, okay, you, you, you performed in the 60s and the 70s. A little, well, actually, mm -hmm. I pursued a career in the 60s. Okay. After I had those two beautiful children you saw there. Yes. I just couldn't figure out how you do all this stuff and do this and do that and take care of your children and go to Girl Scouts or go to this. I basically was at home. I was a stay-at-home mom, and I truly enjoyed it. And I will say this, I would be really annoyed if they had it turned out, as the kids say, raggedy. Yeah. But <laughs> I'd be real annoyed. But my daughters are absolutely beautiful. Um, if, you, if you see me in something, and I did work a lot in the 70s, okay. but I wasn't pursuing. They would just come. Yes. I think there's, let me, let me just say this. I'm in... Sanford and Son, mm -hmm. uh, what's happening? What's the happening witch. now? Mm -hmm. um, um, good times. Good time, yes. which and guess what? Du Bois. <laughs> when they sent yes. me the script, mm -hmm. guess what my name was in the script? What? Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Judy for Judy, okay. Judy. They, wrote what you they were all, it was all yes. like, oh, did they write this for me? I don't know. The name's Judy, okay. Wow. But my kids would always say to me, um, Mommy, you need to go back in the business. Mm -hmm. We're in junior high, we're in high school. You need right. to go back. I said, Look, as soon as Spike Lee comes knocking at my door, or Mr. Sidney Portier comes <laughs> knocking at my door, I'll go back in the business. Hope you're listening, fellas. Hope you're listening. <laughs> I get home one day and my daughter Sean said, my daughter Sean said, this yeah. is she was, she says, uh, mommy, Spike Lee called. <laughs> really? Has a script for you. It's like she said, she said, Mommy, you said if Spike Lee came knocking at your door. I call that knocking at your door. <laughs> right. So it was. He had a part he wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. um, it was for um, a film he was doing that was going to be become a series. Gotcha. Uh, it was, oh, God, what was the name of the film? It was about San Francisco and the gangs in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I played a 90-year-old woman. <laughs> so if you see the movie, you won't even know it's me. But it was supposed to be like in flashback. So mm -hmm. at earlier times, I would have been like me. But for the pilot, it was me as the older woman. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. on a chrome walker. Right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> there are other writers, other producers. Now, I know there's a guy here in town. His name is what? Don B. Welch? Oh, Don B. Yes, Welch. That guy. Oh, Don B. Welch and Michael Ajakwe. <laughs> Emmy yes. Award winning Michael yes. Ajakwe. I've done a. Michael Ajakwe's written this fabulous script, and we did, um, we did a film. We did, it's a pilot. Okay. No, actually, it's not a pilot because we did nine episodes. <laughs> We've already shot nine episodes, and um, it's a role he 
wrote especially for me, mm -hmm. and it's comedies. Like I said, I love comedy. I just <laughs> really do. This is Michael Ajakwe. He was part of that whole magnificent group of men who had Martin, mm -hmm. and Michael works all the time. He's a wonderful comedic writer and drama, but mm -hmm. comedy, he's just right on it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's for Michael Ajakwe. So looking for it, be looking for it. And the working title is Basketball Wife. But that's not going to be the title when it's out there. But that's just the working, the working title, yeah, right. yes. Mm -hmm. And then my uh, Don Welch, mm -hmm. he calls me and he was like, I want you to come do it. I said, oh, Don, I'm retired. He says, I'm going to bring you out of retirement. <laughs> that's <laughs> so, that's so, so that was Don. Yeah. So Don wrote this <clears throat> wonderful play. Oh, it was just magnificent. And um, It's called? Uh, uh, divorce? The, the, the divorce. <laughs> it's called The Divorce. Uh -huh. And we did it as a play production, and we did it numerous times. We, we traveled in the, throughout the United yes. States doing it, and it was just fun. And it was comedy, which yes. I love. If you if you wave comedy in front of me and it's really funny, I'm going to do it because I, I love some comedy. And Don has a wonderful mm -hmm. timing and mm -hmm. writing skills for comedy. Yes. Um, and then we did it as a film. Yes. So it's out there now as a film, uh, The Divorce. And who's in the cast? Oh, my like God. It was, John Lewis? Oh, all, my, all my girlfriends are in the cast. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Frida Payne and Don Lewis, uh, Vanessa Bell Calloway, Tatiana Adali, all these pretty talented <sighs> ladies. We had a ball. We, we, we just had an absolutely wonderful time. Hmm. Um, so that... That got me out of it, out of um, retirement. out of retirement Good. for the moment. Good. But right now, I'm very busy with my new grandson. Yes. What's <laughs> so, it like being a grandmother now? Oh, it's heaven! Because you can just play, 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 and then say, "Oh, what you do to do what?" Oh, here. <laughs> 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 Give to the moms. Uh. <laughs> here. Oh, my daughter's a magnificent mommy. Mm -hmm. A magnificent mommy. And his name? And his name is. Stephen Hightower the third. the third. Yes. yes. And my daughter um, is married. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, who's the my attorney and my daughter, right. is also married. And my lovely Southern California daughters live in the coldest places in the whole United <laughs> States of America. Um, so I'm I, I I do a lot of traveling. I'm Got flying you. back to see one daughter, flying back to see the other daughter. Yes. <laughs> so you love I have, miles, don't you? Yeah, I yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. yep. Absolutely. But I'm it's blessed. very warm and worth it when you get to the other end to see you guys. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And he's just absolutely adorable. And just how so. old do you say he is now? He's two. Two? He's two years old. Ooh. Yes, yes, yes. So my daughter, Julia, will be taking care of that little baby, yeah. and uh, she'll be getting back in the business okay. after he gets to a, a certain height. Okay. Um, I, she's not going to retire like I did or mm -hmm. not figure it out. Mm -hmm. I think she's going to be back in the business because... I think today, women within the industry, especially mm -hmm. African American women, mm -hmm. I think there's a better opportunity. There's more there for you to do. Yes. It was such a tunnel vision mm -hmm. um, career when I was doing it, because you just had to only concentrate on that narrow, narrow, narrow little road mm -hmm. that was there if you planned on walking that road. Mm -hmm. You really did. You just that was it. And there was no way of doing that in the 60s and early 70s when I had my children um, to do it. But I did do one thing. I'm very happy, and I told my daughters to do the same thing, is I think all women, ladies, all women should have their 20s absolutely free, if it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Just be free in your 20s. Don't have any little babies until you hit about 28, 29. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I think you bring so much more. To a marriage. Yes. You bring so much more. You got to play out. Now you want to get in. Uh, and well, get it's, about it. it's, it's, sure. but, but I just think you should have your freedom to develop who you are. Yes. Because if you go from 18 under your parents and now you're under with the husband or with the boyfriend, yeah. uh, where was your space? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my daughters took my advice. They mm -hmm. did not get married until then after their careers and, gotcha. and education. You also uh -huh. are a history maker. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm a history maker. Yes. I think in regards to um, the era that I was in the business, mm -hmm. it was such a limited, limited, limited place to be. Yes. Um, uh, there's a lot of firsts, as we had talked about, mm -hmm. in front of my name, first this, first that, that mm -hmm. and first this. And 
um, and just continuing to to make it a wider a, a wider road for those who come behind us and and I think the road is getting wider get wider now yeah. I mean it doesn't have to be a road it could be like a whole you know a whole freeway right. yeah. <laughs> you know it could be the whole place and we don't have to stay in one lane I think we just we're just everywhere now but there's still work to be done oh god is there work to be done yes. especially within the controlling uh, situation mm -hmm. and do you know that this this is like something that's happened in the last five or six years yeah about five or six years Screen Actors Guild mm -hmm. and AFTRA now they're together because of color coded casting they had to form an organization to try to figure out why dark brown ladies could not get managers or agents. Mm -hmm. This is not me talking. This is Screen Actors Guild mm -hmm. speaking. And it was, it, statistics showed that was just what it was. If you were dark brown, you were not hardly going to work. Um, you had to be honey colored. We're talking 21st century. Yeah. Uh, so when they came to me, mm -hmm. as one of the brown ladies came to me, and Anna Marie Horsford, and Michelle Nichols, and other person of my hue, mm -hmm. to help them figure out what the problem was. Right. This is Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> screen right. Actors Guild. Mm -hmm. So we had to sit them down and tell them what the problem was, because they just could not figure it out. Um, they did. They figured it out. So Good. they realized they had to... Um, have some type of program after we did a number of seminars mm -hmm. uh, inviting young women. We had a room full of maybe 200 dark brown women who were standing up say, telling their stories of how they're always asked, dancers were there also, always asked to be on the back line or they only have a quota for how many dark women can be in the video. Mm -hmm. I mean serious stuff oh, yes. like that. Oh, I yes. mean, t um, don't get me started on The Bachelor. Don't get me started on that show. Oh, on The Bachelor? Oh yeah. They don't have too many black uh, men in that one. We're not talking about, I'm not talking about gender. All right. I'm talking about color. color. I'm talking about color too. Yeah. I'm talking about color. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what Screen Actors Guild was talking about. Yeah. They didn't understand the color coding casting. Mm -hmm. So uh, if it said pretty, it meant fair skin. Yes. And that's who was cast. So you could send your, your, your agent could knock on doors if you could get an agent. Yeah. So that was one of the problems they, they, um, they were helped solve by having a program that they were going to try to educate casting directors because right. they probably th didn't realize what they were doing, that mm. they were doing this. Yes. So it was the union who came forward. We didn't go and ask them because who would think we could go and say, hey, union, they won't. No, it was the union mm. who came to us. Right. <laughs> so I, that problem, I think I see different hues of young ladies and different hues of men, but the men never had the problem. It was only the ladies. We ain't gonna argue about that now. But no, that. <laughs> they have the stats now. They yes. have the stats. It was called Dark Chocolate, formed yes. by mm -hmm. Screen Actors Guild. Gotcha. For only the ladies. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Now you get very much involved in community events oh. and projects. One of which is the Kwanzaa Foundation. Kwanzaa Foundation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's that's. I think if you're here and you're blessed, you have to give back. You have to give, you have to share, you have to help. Yeah. And one way of doing it is in a collective manner. Yes, uh, we can all work together. I, in the 60s and the 70s, I was being asked and to come and help raise money for this organization and that organization. I was like, well, where's the money going? Oh, just stand here and smile and MC or be Mr. <laughs> Ceremony. So I said, well, now if I come in here helping them raise monies, mm -hmm. what would happen if an organization was made up of women with in the entertainment industry. Yes. So I came up with the idea <laughs> of forming an organization of women within the entertainment industry. So I'm the founder of Kwanzaa Foundation. Yes. And I reached out to my girlfriends who were in the business. Mm -hmm. um, they all were like, oh yeah, that'll work. Mm -hmm. I'm talking 1973. And within that organization, some of them are not with us now, but the first group of them was Isabel Sanford, uh, and Marla Gibbs is still here. Um, I got um, 
Good Times, uh, Esther Rose, Esther Rose Jane yeah. Kennedy, Vanetta McGee, um, Beverly Todd, Beverly Todd oh, yes. Sheila Frazier, yes. just the whole wonderfully talented ladies who came. Pam Greer, as mm -hmm. I'm talking, mm -hmm. I'm coming up with names, mm -hmm. but I don't. Once you get on that name calling, then you get on a slippery slope because, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a senior now, so okay, but. The ladies came, and yes. we just had a wonderful time giving back to the community, doing fundraisers, mm -hmm. and it has evolved in the 21st century. We now do the spoken word. Yes. Uh, Beverly and I coordinated, Beverly taught. Yes. We coordinated, and we, we do one every year. We do one event a year, and uh, uh, raise, we have a grant from the city, yes. and that's how we did it. Right. And that's what we did. And uh, we, uh, Kwanzaa Foundation is a recipient mm -hmm. of NAACP Image Award mm -hmm. for Community Service. Right. Yes. yes now yes, you yes. say the city. There's one gentleman who we cannot forget. His <laughs> name is former police chief, former city councilman oh. Bernard Park. You mean that? Can you roll that for me, please, Lamar? Yes. Okay, you go. All You know, I haven't missed one. Every time I'm always there. This gentleman has attended 
every event called the spoken word oh, yeah. for the last 14 something years. Like that. Like that. And he always brings this gift. It's a silver dollar. <laughs> All right. <laughs> always. He's one of our, um, let's say, everything we do, you're always there. He's always supporting us. It's my pleasure. You, you are out and about I'm very with the community. Very honored to see really you. Really and truly. It is a door. And by the way, uh, we don't end there. Ah. Uh, you being the lady that you are, I'd like to present you with a, a small rose. Oh, why, thank you, darling. You are so much. Thank you so much. Oh, that's mm. lovely. Indeed. Indeed. You are such a gentleman. <laughs> we try our best He is. He's a sweetie pie. <laughs> We'd like to ask you one more question because we've right. got a few more minutes. All right. How do you want to be remembered? Oh, first of all, I want to be remembered and my memory will con my the remembrance of me will continue within my daughters mm -hmm. and my grandson um, that they are a reflection of me mm -hmm. they are absolutely magnificent if you see them then you'll know me <laughs> they are giving loving talented brilliant young ladies and they will continue and I'm hoping there's ripples that I have caused within this community that helping others um, with the organizations we have given monies to and the interactions I've had with people. I just think that we have to have our spirits always be high, lifted high, and in that way you don't have um, all this ugly stuff that can happen to you. <laughs> Doesn't get you. Um, so I would like to be, rem and, and also, of course, remembered as a, a lady within the industry whose dad, my dad and my mom, taught me to have no fear. No fear. If you want to be a movie star, baby, you can be a movie star. We don't live in Jackson, Mississippi. We live right here in Southern California, MGM Studios, right down the street. <laughs> I mean, and my dad wanted so much for all of us to have a great education. Um, my, my dad always said, everything's here for you in Southern California, and my mom did too, and I have their spirit within me, and I'm hoping, and I think I passed it on to my children, and they will pass it on, and I've shared it with other people. And also, I was a really good actress too, and still <laughs> am. am. And yes. Empire, I sure would like to do your show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope the right people saw what you said today and get you on there. Uh, Any final thoughts that you have? Yes, I do have a final thought. All of this, there's... Sometimes there's elements that are printed regarding you, mm -hmm. and I don't like it because this is one thing. I think it disrespects my parents. If you read my biography and they say I came from humble beginnings, mm -hmm. I think they said that about everybody brown back in the 60s, if you just show they didn't know your background. Mm -hmm. um, my dad and my mom worked very, very hard. I mean, they were magnificent, um, putting me in the best schools, living in the best neighborhood they possibly could. So if you read I Came From Humble Beginnings, that ain't true. And I've been trying to get that changed for a long time. I went to school, um, grammar school and junior high school, only little black Christian in the whole school. Everybody else was Jewish and upper middle class. I was little black Christian who was middle class. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'd like, I want to get that out. So yeah. I, I really, really do. My dad was the first lead man at Douglas Aircraft, All right. first black one. And my mom, of course, had the, the dress shop Kitty's and Kitty's Boutique. Yes. And um, we had a lovely life living in a beautiful single family home. Mm -hmm. in the house when I moved out to be, as my mom said, you think you're grown now, you get an apartment. <laughs> yes, mommy, I'm leaving View Park and the seven bedroom house we own here. And that's the house I came from when I went out into the world. So no, I did not come from humble beginnings. My dad and mom worked really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a disrespectful statement and I haven't been able to get it changed. They won't change stuff. Wow. It's in my bio if you read it. Oh. Well, you did read it because you did your homework. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As he always does. Uh -huh. But um, that's pretty much it. And um, I'm just happy that I know this guy over here. <laughs> but he knows everybody. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he knows everybody. Because yes, you does. opened up a lot of doors for me. I mean, uh, John oh. Wesley, so many people. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I've been, you know, I've, the quiet as it's kept, yes. I've been casting his show, you guys. I've been I've been getting these people on his show for him. Is that not right? <laughs> That's true. Yes, ma'am. I'm exaggerating a little bit, <laughs> but I just.
send you a few. Yes, yeah, okay. she did. Okay. Yes, she did. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. When I mentioned your name, when I said uh -huh. Judy Pace, doors <laughs> open up. Oh, no. oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they do, I'm glad they do. You know, yes. I'm glad they do if they do, really and truly. But I really have enjoyed being here and just kind of reminiscing with you about um, different shows I've done yes. and the different people I've interacted with. And I... I love the fact when ladies, grown women, come up to me now who are in their 50s or 60s, mm -hmm. and they say, I used to watch, and they're usually dark brown women, I used to watch you on TV, and I was watching you in Peyton Place, and my mommy used to let me watch Peyton Place so I could see you. These are, <laughs> you know, these are women. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm hoping I brought some joy and some fun and some laughs to some people. Yes. And um, I think my mom, and my dad, I thank them both, um, and um, and my grandmother, Amen. and all those those good things here in the state of California. California, yeah. California <laughs> not Mississippi. <laughs> Mississippi, I'm sure you've changed, but I don't know. Wasn't that way? My dad was there. Thank you. Thank so, you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> she is something else. That's my good friend, Miss Judy Pace. I'm glad you liked her today. I'm glad you'll come back again another time. We'll see you then. Take care. Oh, you had me rambling. Right. <laughs>